Hi, it's Dr. Noel Williams, Optimal Health Associates, May 20th, 2020. Um, COVID update uh, today. Uh, first, I won't be doing one tomorrow. It's my son, Hugo's uh, virtual graduation from high school. I know everyone going through virtual graduations is very excited to have them, and it's just an adjustment. But that's him right here. When he's a little kid now, he's 18, going to go off to college, University of Chicago next year. We're all very excited for that. God willing, that that will occur. Um, so, hey, happy graduation to everyone who is graduating from high school, college, middle school, or anywhere else, graduate school. Um, so congratulations to everyone and their families for supporting them. Uh, so COVID today, uh, worldwide, almost a little over 5 million cases, 323,000 deaths. The big thing in the world data is this was one of the largest days of COVID infections in the last 24 hours. It was over 102 or 3,000. What's happening is there's a shift now more towards central and the or well, Central and South America, but the Southern Hemispheres now, which makes sense because they're going into their fall and winter. And so it would make sense that their cases are going to pick up. There's a lot more cases in Russia, too. Um, and so, again, uh, very normal and expected. Again, a little worrisome about the second wave, but which, again, we just have to watch and observe. Um, number two, the United States, uh, we're at about just shy of 93,000 deaths, I think about 1.6 million or so infected. Um, we had 23,000 new cases, I believe, in the last 24 hours. Um, again, as expected, running 20 some thousand cases a day. Um, maybe a slight uptick, but you gotta just, we just have to watch, we watch what happens over the next week and see if there's a little pulse up with a little, a little more liberalization of staying at home. Um, Oklahoma, stats are pretty much stable, um, not, not much change there. So. What are we gonna focus on tonight? Well, first we're gonna talk about mitigation. The mitigation of disease events or disasters. So if we think back to what I thought we needed to do, and I think many of us thought, who were in the medical profession and like the Save Our State people thought, um, we needed to really shelter in place pretty aggressively in February, would have been perfect. And the reason that we were in a mitigation strategy even in February was because the 5 billion Wuhanese who left Wuhan between January 17th and January 23rd when they shut down Wuhan went all over the world. And so 34 of them, it looks like, were the primary spreaders of COVID with some of the ones that hit Europe, Italy, Spain, and then went to New York with a more virulent genomic pattern. And there's always this debate where some scientists say there's a very clear difference in virulence between different genomic strains. And then in the United States, we kind of just don't know, make any comments at a federal level about this, which is confusing to me when we're everywhere else in Italy and Spain and China talk about the difference in virulence. But, and then we also had people came to Japan, Korea, and then eventually to the United States. So shutting off more people coming from China was actually um, probably a little helpful. What well, would have been um, more helpful if we would have realized the extent of the disease penetration in Europe, but we just didn't know that. And so if we could have cut that off a little earlier and then sheltered in place, which would have been going against everything Dr. Fauci said and everything Dr. Redfield said from the CDC and doing that in mid-February um, would have been, I think, pretty spectacular in terms of limiting disease spread. But by the time March came and we started doing it, there was too much disease already in the United States, but sheltering in place did slow down the effects because the goal of sheltering in place or mitigation was to prevent more and more disease hitting all at once and overwhelming the hospitals and then overwhelming ventilators. Again, there was flaws in that as we eventually learned because we were dependent on Chinese data and really what happens with ventilators is the people who go on a ventilator 80% plus of the time do pass way unfortunately but they pass away usually very quickly once they're on the ventilator because it's an end, an end event. There are people who do last on the ventilator for a week or two 
and then or three and recover and that's marvelous but the vast majority of that is not that isn't what happened so there wasn't this overwhelming um, of our ventilators in the United States but that was the initial goal of mitigation was to slow down the onset of the disease into our country and the second purpose of that besides stopping hospital or limiting an overwhelming hospital system because someone asked me or sent me a question about this last night and thank you very much about this was also for us as a, a community in medicine to start figuring out what the heck to do because the way it works is we had little snippets of information from China and we knew there was a new disease and we had to try to figure out what to do and, the, and some very very smart infectious disease doctors and critical care physicians across the country and hospitalists are the ones who led the charge just like they did everywhere else and it was not the governmental physicians who did this it was the doctors in the intensive care units okay it's Aaron Boyd at Norman it's um, David Chansom and in the Integra system it's Dr. Cook it's all these Dr. Nagel and Integris I mean all these wonderful doctors everywhere who had to figure out what to do and so as we got through that phase, we've learned things. And we've learned some very important things about the disease. And one, how to manage it better. But two, we also have learned on who's getting it and who we really need to think about and who isn't getting it. So as we adjust now from a, mitig a full mitigation strategy to what I'm going to always say is a normalization strategy, we need to alter what we're doing because you can't stay in a mitigation strategy for two years. It doesn't work. You have to have normalization. People have to start working again. And I think one of the great things from talking to lots of doing lots of telemedicine visits and people who are working at home, I think our society is going to completely change and many, many people are going to work at home predominantly moving forward, which is wonderful. They're more efficient. They're happier. It's a big win. Um, so we're learning lots of stuff, but the bottom line is we have to now start shifting to normalization, which means, hey, we need to, I'm sorry, we have to be able to go out and go to the store. Now, with I think with a mask, um, that may bug some people, but I think masks are still important when you go to the store. I think you need to go, if you want to go to a restaurant, you can go to a restaurant. Yes, you can have small graduation parties. Um, and yes, you can see your grandchildren, which really sets people off for some reason. And it's pretty particularly funny because to me that that sets people off because back in March is the person in February who was leading the kind of in the medical community who helped lead the public charge for shelter in place and coordinated innumerable physicians, media appearances, uh, and thank you to all the TV stations, four, five, and nine in Oklahoma City again. Um, Kelly Fry, the editor of The Daily Oklahoman, who put all these physicians, including myself, all over the place with the same message, shelter in place, shelter in place, shelter in place. So at that point, it was pretty funny. I started getting all these negative emails and criticisms that I must be a very liberal person. And, and some of it was derogatory, but I, I don't really care. And it was funny to me that, oh, if, if you're presenting science and what we need to do at one point, you get criticized when it's apolitical for me. It's what's it's best practice. And now that I'm saying we can adjust and start doing other things, now it's the, oh, you must be a right winger or a Trump person or da da da. And, and like criticizing someone's political beliefs has become um, like personal. And I should hate myself for if I am either a liberal or or a Republican because of the other group. I mean, the liberals have to hate me if I'm a Republican, the Republicans have to hate me if I'm a liberal. I'm just presenting science. That's all I'm doing. And you just have to understand that and you need to adjust your brain to science evolves and we have to change strategies. So again, it's time to start normalizing and figuring how we can come back as a community. Because if we don't do that, this is going to be a larger and larger problem. Now that's with the caveat that higher risk groups um, do different things, are more conservative, and it's a, with, we have to see what happens with the second wave. If the second wave hits very significantly in the fall, we then have to go to a more aggressive mitigation strategy. 
Nothing we do now is going to affect that. It is going to come back in the fall or not come back in the fall. No one knows. I think we're all very suspicious in the medical community that it's highly likely to come back in October, November, but no one knows. But right now, that is independent of what we're going to do right now. So that's redundant. So that's what I just would encourage everyone to think about, that having an opinion doesn't make you political when you're just presenting science. Likewise, I've put every single article I've talked about online over the last three months. On Facebook. Or on Facebook. I'm sorry, on Facebook, on my Facebook page. Please go to the Facebook page. You can flip through it and you can find it find almost everything I've talked about. I put on some things again today to help people who are newer and act like I'm making this all up. I'm not smart enough to make everything up or anything really up with this virology stuff because it's so sillyly complicated for everyone. And so, but you can learn about viruses and virology. And if you want to learn about it and you're not medical, just start at Wikipedia and just look up RNA viruses and start reading about them. And that makes it easier to start understanding. And you'll be like me. I did not remember a lot about viruses. I know about them some because of my job and treat them frequently, but I had to go back and look and read. And I really want to, again, he probably doesn't want me to mention his name again, Norman Imes, the brilliant critical care doctor and integrist who got me started on RNA viruses and zinc finger proteins and understanding the whole thing. And so again, it's a process of learning for everyone. So rather than getting upset and thinking there's these huge agendas, adjust the fact things change and we're gonna keep on rotating recommendations based on different scenarios. So that's the focus tonight. Let's think about these things. Um, and, and again, I had another YouTube video taken down on the 17th. So I think the drug that shall not be named <laughs> is what I'm gonna always refer to everything as now. So the drug that shall not be named, I did put some data out on it today, including the NYU study. Interestingly, the drug that shall not be named is mandated for every exposed person in India um, now. And so that's an interesting thing that the rather, I think, robust and highly um, advanced Indian healthcare system, maybe not throughout the whole country, but at least in their metropolitan areas, um, has decided that this is a, is a mandated thing. So again, it just shows that whether you believe the drug that shall not be named is good or bad, let's change to could be helpful, may not be helpful. And again, it is 1.2 cardiac events per 1 million monthly doses where you take it for the whole month. So it's a 99.999% chance you are not gonna have a cardiac event if you're a typical patient taking the drug that shall not be named in a prophylactic situation or an early viral situation. There is no standard of care to ever check an EKG on someone and before you start this medicine. So just keep that in mind. And again, our focus for these meds is primarily early use until we get better data. And once we get better data, we may say, oh no, we don't wanna use it, or oh yes, we do. But remember, if you get COVID and you're me, a 55 year old male, I have minimally a 6% death rate and up to a f another 15, to 20% hospitalization rate. So that is a lot. And if I get hospitalized, let's say, so 20% of us get hospitalized, 10% of us get, half that get critical, half that dies. That is a scary amount of healthcare to receive that costs hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars with permanent injury for virtually everyone who gets serious or critical care and who does survive a 0.0001% chance for a cardiac event or just about one in a million um, is rather small and one sixtieth thousandth actually of the risk. So, you know, it's just crazy to me that until we have a better plan that a reasonably safe drug combined with zinc seems to be rather helpful. But 
again, that's my opinion on it. And you don't have to agree with me. That's the beauty of being an American. So anyway, good night. Thank you. And thanks, uh, Kathy Tavanello, for all your help and support and all the other uh, nice texts. Thanks from the Duns today, Kevin and Jennifer. And a lot of people, there's too many people to thank. And so thanks to all of you who are supportive. And be safe. Good night.